Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. And welcome to this fourth and final session in our uh, annual conference, the 20th annual conference. Now, the title of this session is uh, Inequality and Central Banks. And this is an issue that has come to the fore following, in particular, the great financial crisis. The central banks had to keep interest rates low for very long and thereby giving rise to the perception that they've uh, been raising wealth inequality. So it, it's very much an important issue, and to the point that in the annual economic report this year, we devote a whole chapter to it, try to dig deeper into the, and more systematically into the relationship between monetary policy and uh, inequality. Now, we are fortunate uh, to have with us um, Atif Nian, from a professor uh, of uh, economics at Princeton, to present a paper which is very much on, on that subject, which speaks to the, to the issue. And Evi Papa, professor of macroeconomics at the Universidad Carlos III in, in Madrid, who will be discussing. Now, the paper fo focuses on one distributional aspect, and that is the distinction between lenders and uh, borrowers which are mapped into uh, the wealthy and, and the poor. And for this audience in particular, it, it looks uh, at the relationship but, or the impact of monetary policy and the transmission mechanism of monetary policy over the longer term in, uh, in, in an economy in which that factor, that distinction, plays, plays a key role. So without further ado, um, we have 35 minutes for the speaker and 15 minutes for the discussant. And I would ask both of you, please, to stick to the time so that we will have sufficient time for the general discussion. So, Atif, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claudio uh, and the BIS, for, uh, for having me. Um, I've learned a lot over the years, uh, Claudio, both from your work and the uh, uh, tremendous work that's been done at the BIS. It continues to be done at the BIS, especially around the topic that I'm going to talk about, which is inequality and central banks. Um, before I start, let me just point out a, a, a small story um, of the connection between BIS and the work that I'm going to present. There's actually a very close connection in some ways. Uh, six years ago, my co-author, Amir Sufi, was giving the Andrew uh, Crockett Lecture uh, in 2015 at the same uh, annual conference. And he was discussing, among other things, uh, how the pass-through of monetary policy is very different depending on whether you're looking at the very rich or the rest of the population. And it turned out that as he was giving the lecture, and in fact the lecture was recorded, there was a young, smart graduate student at MIT who was listening to his lecture. And as he would later tell us, he listened to it multiple times because he was also thinking about some very similar related issues. And as fate would have it, I ran into that graduate student uh, as he was starting his new job uh, as a professor at Harvard a few years later. And we started chatting about exactly the same uh, topic, which is uh, inequality and monetary policy and, and, and related issues. And we ended up uh, working together uh, uh, for the last uh, two to three years now. And uh, the, the paper that I'm presenting today is very much a result of that collaboration. So um, everything that I'm going to talk about today is based on joint work with Amir Sufi and Ludwig Straub. And, and as you can see, it has a very close BIS uh, connection. Um, so I'm going to try to explain how uh, we view inequality as being extremely important for understanding, especially the long-term shifts in monetary policy, as well as uh, some of the key long-term dynamics in the financial markets, as well as the macro economy. And to understand that basic framework that we have developed, we really need uh, um, a, a, a couple of basic uh, premises to, to build our uh, machinery, so to speak. And I'm going to start with giving you those, uh, 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 those uh, premises. And um, as long as you think that premise is uh, 
uh, reasonable and plausible. Everything else kind of follows logically. So what is the basic premise that uh, this thinking or framework is based upon? The very first one is what I would call fact number one. I'm basically calling it a fact because I think it's pretty well known now. A number of scholars have documented this particular feature, and that is that there is an important difference between the very rich, and I'm going to be referring to the very rich throughout this talk. So to fix ideas, think of the, the, the rich as uh, the top 1% of uh, the, the economy today. Um, the very rich behave very differently from the rest of the population. And again, I'm going to be calling them non-rich throughout this talk. How are they different in their behavior? Well, the key difference is that the very rich tend to save uh, a much higher fraction out of their lifetime income or permanent income as uh, sometimes it is called in technical lingo. So if you earn $100 or $100,000 over your lifetime, if you are very rich, if you belong to the top 1%, you save a significantly larger fraction of that over the course of your uh, 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 life. And, and that's really uh, what you see represented on the slide as well. This, this um, uh, result where you can see that the top one save at a much higher rate out of their lifetime income, this particular study comes from Dylan et al. published in the Journal of Political Economy. But as I said, there are many other uh, studies of this as well. So that's first uh, important fact to keep in mind. And I'll then talk about the consequences of this important fact as we as we go along. The second um, fact that is, uh, again, I would say uh, quite non-controversial is that inequality, and now I'm going to represent inequality as the share of income going to the rich, uh, which again uh, is defined as the top 1%. Um, that definition of inequality has risen a lot over the last four to five decades, as you can see in the graph that is uh, on the screen. Um, in particular, uh, inequality by this definition has almost doubled since its low uh, before the 1980s. And this is what I'm going to refer to as the rise in extreme inequality. And I'm using the word extreme to again refer to the fact that we are measuring inequality as the share of income going to the very top of the uh, uh, income distribution, the top 1% to be precise. So that's it. Just consider these two facts, which again um, should be non-controversial. I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about next are the natural logical implications of these basic facts. And I'm going to highlight that even though those are sort of quite simple and straightforward, once you kind of go through them, implications of these basic facts, they have very important uh, and rather profound implications for understanding where we are today, how we got there, and perhaps most importantly, the implications for policy in terms of what needs to be done, both on the monetary policy side, which is where central banks explicitly get involved, but also on the fiscal and other aspects of macro and financial policy that a government runs. And while central banks may not be directly involved in those other sorts of policy, it's quite obvious that they need to keep a very close eye on those aspects of policy as well. And also, they are often actively involved in, in, in discussions of those policy matters as well. So I, I hope all of this would be of, uh, of, of use to central bankers who are in the audience. Um, but let me now proceed to present the sort of the formal implications of these basic facts. Again, the very rich save at a much higher rate and inequality or extreme inequality has risen considerably since 1980. The, uh, we're going to describe the implications of these basic facts using the terminology indebted demand, uh, which is also the title of the paper that we wrote explaining all of these ideas. And the basic uh, starting point is that once you have those two facts, um, the natural implication is that as 
inequality or extreme inequality rises, and the very rich start getting a larger and larger share of uh, income, if they save at a much higher rate, then a natural implication uh, is going to be that consumption or aggregate demand will tend to fall. So if nothing else happens, the economy is going to have uh, a problem, which is that demand would be too low, and uh, there would be a danger that this economy um, as inequality rises, is going to tip into a recession. However, uh, in order to avoid that recession, uh, the economy naturally, as it often does, there's going to be a particular price adjustment mechanism and some associated changes in the financial side that is going to try to compensate for this weakening of demand as a result of rising inequality to avoid going into that recession that I just mentioned. Um, and that particular mechanism is the following. As inequality rises, the rich are now earning a larger share, and they are saving, hence, a larger amount of total income in the economy. In order to avoid going into a recession, those additional savings are then absorbed by the non-rich through the financial sector in the form of debt. And so this is where debt sort of appears as this very important uh, force uh, that brings the economy back to um, equilibrium and we can avoid the recession. So essentially, uh, when the rich get more after beyond a certain point, the non-rich start borrowing from them in the form of debt, and then they spend that uh, borrowing as consumption to add back to aggregate demand so the economy can maintain the balance that it had prior to the rise in inequality. And again, as Claudio uh, highlighted in the introduction as well, what this means is that the rich start lending. So when we talk about lenders or savers, they are basically the same, which are the rich, uh, think of them again as the top 1% in the economy, and they're lending is taken on by the non-rich, which is typically people below the top income percentiles. Okay, so now you might think if this is where the story ended, you'll say, fine, we had a problem and we solved it. Except the problem does not uh, resolve itself in the long run. And in particular, while you have solved the immediate problem for today by bringing demand back up, because you have done so through debt, and that's what we refer to as indebted demand, because this created demand is indebted in nature, it is driven by debt, there is a big problem uh, next period or in the future. And that problem is that in the future, this debt has to be paid back. And so the non-rich that have currently borrowed to create additional demand, next period, they have to return that money back to the rich. Now, notice something when that happens. When they try to return that money, borrowed money, back to the rich, next period, now we have actually compounded the initial problem in the following sense. Inequality is still high, so you continue to have that weakness of demand driven by the high levels of inequality, but now you have added to that problem because in addition to that problem now, the non-rich are trying to return even more uh, back to the rich because of what they had borrowed in the last period. So clearly, if we had a problem in the previous period, that problem is now going to be even worse when they try to give that money back to the rich. So that's, again, not possible. The economy will go into a serious recession if uh, we force the non-rich to pay back to the rich. So once again, the economy will try to accommodate uh, in other ways to prevent this recession from taking place. And what exactly is that uh, mechanism? Well, that mechanism um, is going to be that interest rate, that key price in the economy, interest rate will start to fall. And the reason it starts to fall is because the economy is trying to make it a easier for the non-rich to pay back that debt, but even more importantly, they are not even going to pay back that initial debt. In, instead, that initial debt is going to be refinanced 
at the lower interest rate. So they have to say, A, they don't have to pay back that earlier debt. And more importantly, they now uh, can borrow even more. Remember, in the next period for the, for the sort of the weakness uh, in demand to go away, the non-rich need to borrow even more. And so the fall in interest rates allows both refinancing of existing debt and uh, it allows or enables the non-rich to borrow even more. That process that I've just described continues to go on over time. So that's what the dynamics of this economy looks like. And this is what we again refer to as the indebted demand dynamics, if you will. But notice as this dynamic goes on, two things are happening. The first is debt is rising. It continues to rise as a share of income, as a share of GDP in this economy. And second, interest rate continues to fall because to allow the non rich to borrow more and more and ever more amounts, interest rate has to be lower. It's an equilibrium uh, object, uh, if, you, if you will. And, and so this dynamic continues in that manner, except interest rates cannot continue to go down uh, beyond zero as uh, uh, it is well known, especially among central bankers and those who work on the monetary side of the economy. So what happens when you reach that, that, that point where interest rates cannot fall anymore? Well, now you have to, if, if again, if inequality continues to remain very high and even starts to or keeps on rising, now you have a real problem which is that the economy will not be able to find enough demand. And now you're going to have that recession uh, that, that, that you were trying to avoid in the first place. And, but moreover, because now you have accumulated such an incredible amount of debt uh, in the economy, and in particular private debt in this framework that I'm, 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 I'm presenting, um, what you're going to have is you're going to have this environment of A, extreme inequality, B, very low or zero interest rate environment, and C, you are going to have this incredible amount of debt that is going to trap the economy into a debt trap. And, and the, the economy is going to have this perpetual and persistent weakness of demand, and it's going to grow less or slower than it should have or could have grown under normal circumstances. And that's what we refer to as the economy getting stuck in this debt trap, which is, again, uh, a sad uh, uh, realization so what I'm going to talk about in the sort of the second half of my talk is what to do when you when you get to that stage. I'm going to come back to sort of the policy issues, what we can do to avoid staying in the debt trap if we have already fallen into it and so on. So I, I, I look forward to having that uh, uh, conversation continue during the Q&A session as well. But let me first go back to this framework of indebted demand in a little bit more detail, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the, the formal ingredients. And I'm, I'm not going to go into, this is the only slide where I'm going to show a little bit of math, if you will. I just want to highlight for those of you who are interested in uh, working in this area, I just want to again highlight the key ingredients that go into um, uh, uh, creating this indebted demand framework. And, and, and really, the key ingredients you're seeing on the slide, the, the, in particular, the very first one is the key. This is fact number one that I was referring to. It's the mathematical formulation of that uh, fact number one, which again, remember, is that the very rich save at a higher rate than the rest of the population um, out of their lifetime or permanent income. That key insight, it turns out, had been missing in our traditional framework or models that have been used to study the macroeconomy, in particular to think about monetary policy. And the way to introduce this fact is uh, by changing the way we typically think of uh, consumer preferences. And in particular, by allowing for non-homothetic with respect to income, um, in, the, in the manner that you see highlighted in the first expression, you have law of consumption, but we add to that this uh, uh, this utility that people experience from accumulating wealth. And the key element of this is that people derive greater utility from accumulating this wealth, which is represented by the symbol A. So V of A is that utility from accumulating wealth, and you derive a greater utility from accumulating wealth, the richer you are. That key um, 
uh, uh, assumption about behavior introduces uh, again this 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 insight that the very rich in this framework are now as they get richer they are now going to save more and more because basically they love accumulating wealth more and more and so that's going to be the natural implication of that um in again mathematically uh, the key implication of that basic uh, 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 premise is going to be that the euler equation in steady state of the rich again think of the top 1% if you will is going to look like the second expression on the on the slide and if you sort of uh, stare closely at this expression what we will realize is that the relationship between interest rate and assets which is the same as debt because debt is the main asset in this economy that relationship is actually a uh, uh, negative or downward sloping and that's the key um, insight formal insight that comes out of this framework which is that the long run saving supply schedule is downward sloping in the interest rate debt space and again uh, i'm going to show you that graphically so just stay with me for a, for a, for a moment and i'll explain that uh, even more um, but that's as much as i'm going to go into the formal details and if you're interested which i'm sure many of you are um in going through the sort of the full details of the formal argument um i encourage you to read uh this the associated paper which is which is now forthcoming in the quarterly journal of economics so let me now um give you a little bit of the intuition of the of this framework which will i think will will really help understand some of the uh, um uh, deeper implications that i'm going to talk about um first let me build or highlight a contrast of the framework the indebted demand framework that i'm presenting and some of the traditional ways of thinking about these questions i think that is useful for understanding why we kind of missed this very obvious after the fact insight that i'm going to uh, I'm, i'm presenting today um so i'm going to start with not the model that i just talked about but i'm going to start with the traditional or the standard way of thinking about these kind of issues and again the key difference in earlier work and what i'm introducing today is that preferences in our model are non homothetic but preferences typically assumed in these models whether they are representative agent models or heterogeneous agent models you may have heterogeneity along other dimensions just discount rate and so on but even then those models have that feature that Uh, uh with respect to lifetime income those models were homothetic that is to say saving whether you are very rich or not saving out of your lifetime income was the same for both individuals so what's the key implication of that the key implication of that is something that i'm sure um all of you who have taken sort of you know graduate economics and so on at the macro level understand very well which is that the interest rate is pinned by the discount rate of this of these Uh, uh uh consumers in this economy who all behave the same on this important dimension of how they spend out of lifetime income and so the interest rate is just pinned by their discount rate and it shows as a flat horizontal line on this interest rate debt space if you add to that the so if if you if you will the red line is the supply of saving right and that's just represented by this horizontal line that supply of saving if you add to that the demand for savings which is coming from the borrower side so the red line is representing the lenders or the savers who will turn out to be the very rich in our framework um the borrowers who will be the non rich uh, they are represented by this again this traditional uh, black line that essentially says as interest rates fall people can borrow more and they borrow more because uh, you know they like to borrow essentially that's why they are they are they are uh, um uh, uh they they demand uh debt and so that is represented by this black line which again is the traditional representation of the demand for savings and the equilibrium is represented by the intersection of the two obviously but notice in this model and this is the key point in the standard model inequality or distribution has absolutely no role to play it has no effect and i think that's one of the key kind of uh, blind spots if you will of the traditional framework that we are trying to highlight in our uh, model so let me now contrast what we have just seen with what happens 
in the framework that I laid out, uh, which is again the indebted demand framework. In that framework, first of all, the borrowing side it will end up looking the, the same. So the borrowers, the demand for savings looks just like the previous uh, graph, uh, 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 the black line. The key difference is going to be the shape of the red line or the red curve, which again is the is the saving supply schedule that no longer um, is flat horizontal, but in fact is downward sloping. This is the Euler equation I was highlighting earlier. This is now I'm drawing that Euler equation graphically. And you can see this is downward sloping and it's no longer a flat line. Again, the equilibrium in the long run is represented by the green dot, which is where these two curves intersect. All of that is fine. But the really interesting stuff happens when you start doing the thought experiment of what happens in this economy as inequality rises. And the key insight is going to be that as inequality rises, this saving supply curve is going to be shifting inwards as the solid line and the new equilibrium will be represented by the red dot. And notice what has happened in this new equilibrium. By the way, why is it downward sloping? Let me just give you another intuition for that. It's downward sloping because the very rich, they like to save more and the richer they are, the more they like to save in order to kind of prevent them from saving more, the richer they are, um, interest rate has to be lower because interest rate is kind of the incentive you're giving them to save more. And so that gives you the downward sloping um, line that the richer they get, interest rate has to be lower to prevent them from continuing to save to infinity, so to speak. And so interest rate has to be lower in steady state. That is, the, again, the key force that delivers this, this downward sloping saving supply schedule and falling interest rate as inequality rises. So you can see here the key difference for, to contrast that with the traditional framework is that now the rise in inequality has a very different effect, which is that you, are, you can see on the y-axis a fall in the interest rate as you go from the green dot to the red dot. And then on the debt dimension, you see a, a, a big rise in, in debt or debt as a fraction of the economy, debt to GDP, if you will, again on the x-axis as we move from the green dot to the red dot. Okay, so now that we have um, understood the basic logic of the framework, is it even relevant, right? Now we want to go to the data and see if this has any bite in the real world. So let's start by looking at what has happened to inequality, which again is the dotted blue line. I've already talked about that. Inequality we know has risen, um, but the timing of it is that it started to rise from 980 onwards. The key prediction or first prediction of this framework is that when that happens, it will be associated with this rise in debt. So let's look at that. Let's look at rise in debt, which is this um, um, orange, uh, to me, uh, to my eyes at least, looking line. Um, and what you can see is that this second um, line, uh, which represents debt, also starts to go up exactly. The timing is kind of very correlated with the timing of rising inequality. And it happens in uh, not just the US, but it happens globally in advanced countries as, as they all kind of start to experience this rising extreme inequality. So the, again, the basic facts are quite consistent with the framework that I've described. But notice the other implication of this framework was that debt will rise and then interest rates will start to fall. So let's look at that prediction. Do interest rates fall as inequality rises? And as, again, this is very well known, no surprises here, um, as inequality starts to rise post 980, that's exactly when interest rate, as represented by the 10-year real rate um, for the US, starts to fall. But again, this is a global phenomena, uh, again, something that is very well known. So the aggregate time series trends, if you will, are very much consistent with the implications of this, this theory. Um, in fact, we can do a tighter test, uh, and, 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 and we do that in the, in, in the paper, and you can read up more on that. Uh, we can do a tighter test in the US in the following sense. Um, the US, as everyone knows, has 50 states, and one interesting fact about those states is that they, they, while they all experience a rise in inequality, the magnitude is very different across different states. So you can see that on the in these two graphs where the change in inequality represented by the change in top income share is, is represented in the, on the x-axis. And what you can see is that in states controlling for income, uh, overall income growth, uh, 
states that see a larger rise in inequality are exactly the same states where the rich, uh, represented by the top 6% here, the rich, they save more and hence they accumulate more wealth. So you can see that wealth to income rises in exactly the more unequal states, number one, and number two, that rise in wealth is driven exclusively due to the additional saving of the very rich. That's what the left uh, uh, figure is showing you. And that's just, I'm just showing you the raw data. That's how strong this pattern is inside the US. So there's a lot of uh, uh, significant, uh, I would say, uh, empirical support for the implications of the framework that I just highlighted. So let's now move forward and think about the implications. Let's move, switch gears, and now talk about implications on the policy dimension. What are the implications of this framework for monetary policy? The first and the very obvious one is that the interest rate that I've been talking about so far, the equilibrium interest rate that I've been talking about so far, that equilibrium interest rate is the, 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 the very well-known R star in, in uh, monetary policy lingo, which is the natural rate of interest in this economy. And notice that natural rate of interest is not given by outside forces here. It's very much an equilibrium concept, and in particular, it is a function. This is the key point, that R star is a function of inequality or extreme inequality. To put it to say it differently, inequality is a structural parameter of the model, and that's a very, very important point to keep in mind. I think we have ignored it for a long time, and this is the key insight that uh, 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 one should take from, from this kind of framework, which is inequality really, really matters, not just in some moral or ethical sense, which it certainly has important implications, but it matters in terms of understanding the structure of the economy. It matters because it changes how the macroeconomy behaves because it changes that fundamental force, which is the natural rate of interest. And by doing that, it is forcing the hand of monetary policy. How? Because naturally the space for monetary policy keeps shrinking as inequality rises because you can't fight against, as is well known, you can't fight against R star. If R star is lower, monetary policy will have to accommodate. It will be forced to accommodate that lower interest rate that is demanded by the natural rate of interest. The other important implication for monetary policy is, and this is a more subtle one, so let me go through that in a little bit more detail. The second implication is that um, imagine you now try to engage in active monetary policy for whatever reason, you're, you're, you're facing some recessionary pressures for other reasons and so on, by easing monetary policy. So by lowering the real rate of interest because you're trying to create additional demand for, for well-intentioned reasons. Well, the, one of the important mechanisms through which monetary policy works is through debt creation or credit creation, as is well known, to create demand. And in modern times, that demand is created, again, through lending to the non-rich. That's just the fact of, 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 of the way our economy is wired. So now what happens in this indebted demand framework as monetary policy eases to generate demand through the creation of debt. Well, exactly the same forces come to life once again, which is that as monetary policy eases and creates more debt, that debt in turn puts downward pressure on future aggregate demand. So this is the catch-22 situation. You can put push any lever that raises debt today, and that really helps because you get a sugar boost from this rise in debt but the key idea in the framework I've just presented is that that sugar rush is not long lasting because once the borrowers have to start thinking about paying back that debt, that's when the headwinds start to catch you and the and, and aggregate demand once again starts to, uh, starts to go down. And it's because of that force, which again is the indebted demand force, that monetary policy easing today means interest rates tomorrow will also have to stay low. And that's the important connection, um, if you will. It builds kind of this ratchet effect uh, in, within monetary policy, which is what I'm referring to here as limited ammunition. You can ease rates today, but that means you are less able to lower rates tomorrow because of this indebted demand force that I've just described. And, and this intuition loosely has been very much in the in the air, so to speak, of key central bankers. I could give you many quotes, but just in the interest of time, I'll give you a quote from 
our 2021 Andrew Profit uh, um, 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 lecture uh, um, uh, 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 speaker, who is Mark Carney, of course, of the Bank of England, who says the sustainability of debt burdens depends on interest rates remaining low. So this idea, this connection between debt today and future interest rates is very much appreciated by uh, central bankers practically. And, and I hope that this uh, indebted one framework gives them a language to formalize this, this, this particular intuition. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if these forces continue to go in the direction in which they have been, you push yourself against zero lower bound and you fall into a debt trap. Okay, let me just last couple of minutes. What can we do? This is my last slide. What should be done? The very first uh, implication is, and it's kind of an obvious one, but I think it's still a, uh, an important one, which is we need to revise our macroeconomic models. And I hope that the framework I've presented gives us one way of doing that, of course, this is, this is a very exciting research agenda, and I, and I hope people at the BIS and other central banks continue to push these frontiers forward. There's a whole bunch of other stuff to do. But again, it's very important to think of frameworks where inequality matters, because it sure does when you look at the data. That's another way of thinking about it. And so we need to revise our frameworks. And perhaps one reason, as is well known, that everyone, including central banks, have been wrong about their forecast of future interest rates. One important reason could be that they have ignored the role of rising inequality or worsening distribution on the macro economy. And so I think that's a super important insight to, to keep in mind in the future, which you may have neglected in the past. Um, the other um, important implication is that monetary policy, again, is well known, and it's obvious in this framework as well, because you get into this debt trap, monetary policy is going to be ill-equipped to deal with the really the serious consequences of this weakening aggregate demand due to extreme inequality. So emphasis needs to be on other structural parameters of the economy. In particular, inequality is bad for all the reasons I mentioned, and so that highlights the importance of equitable and inclusive growth. Anything and everything that we can do to go in that direction should be done. What? How to achieve that? Well, there are some important uh, ways uh, that can be done. Progressive taxation is an obvious one. Just to bring it back to focus for the U.S., uh, which I'm most familiar with, taxation in the U.S., when you include all taxes together, is actually not very progressive. It looks mostly like a flat tax environment. That's not the right uh, framing of tax rates. They need to be more progressive. That's obvious. Wealth taxes, I think it's time we start thinking seriously about wealth tax, not from a revenue raising perspective necessarily. Notice you need taxation for progressivity in taxation and wealth taxes to rebalance the economy the right way. I, I, I think that is an important distinction of what this framework highlights, which is we need to think of taxation not only in a revenue raising framework that might be good, but we need to look at it from this rebalancing of the macroeconomic um, angle as well, which is very important. And lastly, we need to focus on public investment, especially the kind of investments that promote equality of opportunity. Think of education, think of R&D in uh, 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 university centers and so on. Um, and, and, and to go along with it, we need to promote competition in markets, which have become more and more concentrated over time for various reasons. Um, I'll close on that with, again, the, the, this, this reminder that extreme inequality is really important. It, 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 it is a fundamental of the macro economy that affects everything else that happens in the economy. And most importantly, if extreme inequality goes unaddressed, it can lead to these kind of debt traps that make the overall collective worse for everyone. You know, as I often like to say, we are all in this together. And so extreme inequality is not just a battle between haves and have-nots, but it, it makes us all worse off and the future generations worse off through the forces, the kind of forces that I tried to highlight. So with that, I'll close. Uh, thank you, Claudio and the BIS once again for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to um, a discussion from, uh, from Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, Atif. I, I thought that was a very, very clear presentation, and I'm sure that it will elicit a, a lively discussion uh, as we get into uh, after the next discussant, who will be uh, have 15 minutes. Uh, have, have, have you have 15 minutes to, to cover the, the topic? Uh, 
All right. Uh, thank you very much, Satif, for a very clear presentation. And thanks to the organizer for uh, inviting me to this great event and to actually uh, discuss this great paper. I never met Atif before, but I'm a very great fan of his work. So I'm very glad to have uh, to interact with him like directly through this discussion. So now you would be all thinking, what is this forehead doing behind? So the forehead uh, behind the screen is the head of Solon. And why I put Solon there? Because I just wanted to highlight to you that uh, debt burden is not a new phenomenon. If we go to the archaic times in the sixth century in Athens, we have a debt crisis uh, due to a, a great, a great uh, debt accumulation by like uh, several farmers to the top classes of the Athenian society. And then Solon get, uh, gets uh, invested as an archon at Athens in uh, 590 uh, BC. And the first measure he took, according to Plutarch, to Plutarch, is that he introduces this sisachthia. Sisachthia is a Greek word that comes from the verb siso, which means shake, and achthos, which means burden. So basically, Sisachthia was shaking off the burdens. And what uh, uh, Solon has introduced was to cancel all outstanding debts, to emancipate all enslaved debtors because they could put themselves as collateral, and it gave back all confiscated uh, property and forbade the use of personal freedom as a collateral. So uh, if we want to think about this, this is a debt jubilee that actually the authors say that it could be a possible option in the debt trap with some macro prudential policy elements that have to do with the fact that we forbade from here on the personal freedom as collateral. So uh, although the times are different, I think uh, that uh, uh, the basic message is similar. Indebted demand was and uh, it is still a very important issue. So the paper of uh, Atif and his co-author is very well uh, 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 welcome in the literature. But now, since I went back to the old times, I will uh, concentrate my talk and I will talk about AIDS and debt burden. I think that you all understand it is different to lift weights if you are young and different to lift weights if you are old. So. I think that this is an important element because if we go to the data, this comes from the Congressional Research Service analysis on consumer finances, what we see is that actually who is really holding the debt is the young, is people below uh, 45 years old. And this is true whether we look at uh, 89, back to 89 or we look at 2016. So I was wondering, reading the paper, is it only a matter of indebted demand or should we also think about the indebted supply? What I have in mind, the authors claim that greater debt level means that a greater transfer from, of income in the form of debt from the, uh, from, for, the, for the payments of debt service from the borrowers to the savers. And I agree. And this is going to lead to a, a, a depressing demand. But at the same time, if I am able uh, to borrow when uh, I am young and I need to borrow in order to study and to, to increase my human capital accumulation, for example, then what is going to happen is that this capacity of me of borrowing is going to enhance my human capital and it's going to further in the future enhance growth and actually reduce inequality. So I think that this kind of channel is missing of, from the analysis and I think it is an important channel. And since Atif said that we should revise the macro models, I think that we should try to also incorporate the age dimension of debt here. And I say that that because here I am borrowing some results from a student of mine, a very nice paper that she has on the effects of fiscal policy on, uh, uh, on different age groups. She provides this graph that it is actually replicating earlier results in the JP by Ben Borath, where she, she estimates the life cycle profiles of different uh, 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 cohorts. And as you can see, surprisingly, what we see is that the life cycle profiles of uh, productivity, they all increase with age and especially they increase sharply before you are around 40. So I think that we have to think that a higher expected income should also kind of ease the debt burden because usually we borrow 
and we borrow relative to our income. So if income is to increase, then this uh, debt burden uh, from the indebted demand, especially for the young population, should be uh, less unbearable, let's say. But uh, since uh, ATIF concentrated on, on, uh, on monetary policy, uh, let me do the same. And uh, what uh, the paper uh, shows here is that what happens when uh, monetary policy is accommodative and we live in an indebted uh, demand environment is that actually what monetary policy is going to do by reducing the interest rate is going to boost uh, demand through the credit channel and also boost uh, inadvertently also debt accumulation. Well, what this implies is that along the path, as we go forward, more debt is going to be ac accumulated and this is going to actually drag demand in the future, limiting the ammunition of monetary policy. So what I thought uh, it would be useful to do and to show you here is to show you, to borrow some of my results uh, on a recent paper that I have with Sebastian Rast and Alejandro Vicondoa, in which what we do is we actually try to uncover the heterogeneous effects of shocks to trend inflation. Now you tell me how this is related. Well, it is very related because we were inspired by the change in the Fed's uh, uh, monetary policy stance and what is probably going to come also from the ECB. And we thought that, okay, we have seen how normal monetary policy shocks transmitted the economy. What about this uh, uh, news uh, about trend inflation? And these are shocks that we're going to see more often from now on, because you can think about these shocks as shocks to forward guidance, as shocks to the, uh, to the inflation target, among other things. So what we do is that we identify these new shocks to trade inflation as shocks that best explain future movements in trade inflation over the coming five Five years. And then what uh, we do in the paper is we analyze their transmission for debtors and savers as uh, uh, Cloyne and his co-author do in an earlier paper, and we compare them with the standard uh, uh, Roman and Roman shocks, so the standard monetary policy shocks. So what we want to specifically investigate here is the credit channel of monetary policy as the one that uh, Atif has highlighted, and also to see whether these shocks have different effects on house prices relative to the standard shocks. So, following this maximum forecast error variance uh, approach for identification of the shocks, we recover these shocks to trend inflation that, as you can see, increased trend inflation uh, uh, after like five years with uh, reaching their maximum around, uh, uh, sorry, eight quarters. And they increase PC inflation. And at the same time, they don't move the interest rates on impact, but with a, with a substantial lag. So they have a similar implication with the standard uh, Romer and Romer shocks in the sense that they decrease the real interest rate as uh, standard uh, uh, monetary policy shocks do. So once I, we have identified these shocks, then we go and we run some local projections in which we look at, we, we group households according to different characteristics. In particular, we look at whether they are mortgagers or owners or renters, so to, uh, 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 to try to uh, summarize their uh, debt position. And then we look how uh, the uh, variables of interest, like the consumption or the liabilities of these agents uh, react to, uh, to these shocks. And we are going to look at both the Romer and Romer and the standard shocks. So if we look at the aggregate, what we find is that these new shocks, like these shocks to trend inflation, to inflation expectations, if you wish, are more powerful uh, relative to the standard Romer and Romer shocks in uh, uh, simulating the economy. So you can see this from the difference in the green uh, dotted lines versus the continuous blue lines. And here we have confidence intervals with respect to the two shocks. The green dotted, uh, dotted lines are the responses of GDP, consumption, investment, house prices, mortgage payments, and rental payments to the uh, inflation expectation shocks, let's say, while the blue lines and, and uh, the shaded areas around them are the confidence bands for the standard Romer and Romer shock. So what we see is that relative to the standard Romer and Romer shocks, these uh, inflation expectation shocks are going to move house prices a lot and they will stimulate more investment and consumption. 
So now let's move to the part which is more uh, uh, relevant uh, for uh, the analysis, which is the response of consumption and of liabilities, which is related to the paper uh, that Atif just pre uh, presented. So what we see is that we said that on aggregate, these shocks are going to be more potent to move consumption uh, demand. And if we divide the demand between the different uh, consumer groups, so owners, mortgagers, and renters, what we see is that it is mortgagers and owners that mostly react to the shock differently relative to the standard Romer and Romer shock. Again, here the blue uh, 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 continuous line and the shaded areas are the responses to the standard Romer and Romer shock. So having said that, I will move now to the consumer, uh, the, the survey of consumer finances, and I'm going to look at how actually these shocks affect liabilities. And this is an overview of the data I'm using. I have data between 1994 and 2018. And as you can see uh, here, from, uh, for example, from the, from the first uh, graph, we see that most of the consumer's debt is mortgage debt, residential debt. And uh, we see that the personal debt is lower. And after the, 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 the Great Recession in the US, the, the, the amount of uh, actually uh, consumer debt has decreased substantially. So let's move to what uh, we are interested in here, which is to try to test like the empirical implications of uh, Atif and co-authors model. So here we look at the debt channel and we look at how these Roman and Roman shocks, the standard monetary policy shocks, affect debt accumulation. So what you see on the right top panel here is the response of uh, uh, the liabilities of owners, and on the uh, left uh, bottom panel, we have mortgages and renters. So we see that indeed, standard monetary policy shocks are going to increase the liabilities of mortgages. Surprisingly, actually, they decrease the liability of owners, especially in the short run, and even actually in the long run, and they don't seem to be affecting the liability of renters. Now, when we're going to move to look at these inflation expectation shocks or the shocks to the trend inflation, what we observe is that these shocks also are affecting the liabilities of mortgages and owners. So the mechanism that Atif is describing in his paper is relevant. We see it in the data. We see an increase in liabilities, whether we look at standard monetary policy shocks or shocks like that might affect inflation expectations or shocks to forward guidance, we do observe a, a, an increase in the liabilities. However, I will go back now to my age argument because there's a very nice paper by Arlene Wong in which she shows that the large consumption response to monetary policy shocks comes from homeowners who refinance or enter new loans. And actually, this is concentrated among younger people. So again, age will matter. And what I will do is now I will uh, move my data and instead of looking at owners versus renters and versus uh, uh, mortgages, I will look at old individuals versus uh, uh, medium age or whatever, middle uh, age individuals and young. And here, a, the age groups are below 35, between 35 and 65 and above 65. So what do we see in this graph? What we see in this graph clearly is that if we look at standard monetary policy shocks, it is basically the, the young that increase their liabilities in longer horizons. And even if we look at shocks to trend inflation, like uh, forward guidance or inflation targeting shocks, uh, what we see is a similar pattern. It is mostly the young that they are actually accumulating debt. And this brings me back to my original observation, which is, it is not that everybody is borrowing the same. If it is the young that borrow because they need to be borrow, then maybe we have a supply side story to the indebted demand that I think that future models should take into account. I am very happy to confirm the results of ATIF that it is true that monetary policy is indeed increasing liabilities and debt of, uh, of uh, mortgages, but this is still more relevant, it looks like, for younger individuals. So uh, I think that it would be very important for the policy uh, papers or the macro papers to come 
that we introduce also this age dimension into the model because I think it will they, it it will uh, make us uh, have more interesting trade-offs between like the indebted demand story and the some effects on debt on the young that they have been left unmodeled here and I think it would be very interesting to see uh, how this uh, uh, will look like in the future. So let me finish as I started with Solon. So this is a very nice paper for both academic and policy makers. I, has, I have been extremely uh, um, inspired by it. I learned a lot and thanks the organizers for giving me the chance to, to read it deeply. And uh, I think that we uh, have identified here in this work a new trade-off for debt-based stim uh, stimulus, which is very important. ATIF has already highlighted how this will be important for our fiscal policies and which kind of uh, 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 instruments we are going to use for fiscal policy. And uh, I, I think that there is a bold uh, policy recommendation in one paragraph in the paper, which talks about this debt jubilee. And I wanted to say that this is Achthea, uh, which is the same thing. Actually, it is not that bold. I mean, we have seen it in Iceland in 2008, and we have seen that it has worked. So maybe we just have to broaden our minds and take in like uh, more bold actions, uh, because I think uh, debt is a, a very serious business for macroeconomic policy. And uh, if you allow me, I think that it is uh, mostly like government debt that uh, probably we should focus from now on and in the time to come after the uh, COVID recovery. And uh, I will leave it here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evi. So, Atif, maybe you would like to uh, respond to, to the comments, the age dimension, and maybe if you want to say something about government debt, I know that you're working on that. Sure. Um, thank you, Evie. This, this was great. Um, thank you so much. You know, one additional advantage, uh, along with all the others, of having a discussion from Greece is that you get a very useful dose of, uh, you know, history as well. So, so Thank you for that. I really, really appreciate that, and I look forward to all of the work that you that you highlighted in your uh, in your uh, talk so well. Um, just uh, on the first of all, on the on the productivity point. Um, so first of all, um, uh, Avi is exactly right conceptually that uh, to the extent borrowing is being done by those who's uh, who, are, who are expecting rising productivity and incomes in the future, uh, indebted demand is. Uh, 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 not an issue. Uh, that's that's exactly right. Um, what, uh, in fact, we we, uh, we have a follow up empirical paper. It's called "Saving Blood of the Rich," and I I, I would do encourage people who are interested in sort of a more uh, thinking on this issue to 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 read that. Um, it turns out that when you look at the data, while it is true, of course, as uh, as you rightly pointed out, that a lot of the borrowing is done by the by the young, uh, we can actually control for age and look at within. Uh, the same age cohorts. What's really important is who is within those age cohorts is, is doing this borrowing. Is it the very rich who with rising incomes, the fastest rising incomes within that group who are doing that? So I would really encourage people to who, who, who look at this uh, age differences to you know split up age further within the same age cohort to again look at differences by income and income growth. And when you do that, what you find is that unfortunately it is again, the same picture repeating itself, which is that it is more, uh, uh, the, 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 the borrowing is sort of biased, if you will, towards the, those dimensions that are not experiencing the big gains that everyone, uh, not everyone, but the, the you know people at the top are experiencing. So I think just separating that analysis further at that level, it turns out is very important. and and. And, and, and that's exactly the direction in which we should go, as Evie highlighted. Uh, the, the, the other last point I'll make, um, and, and, and then I want to open up for uh, questions and answers, Claudia, if that's okay with you, and I'll, I'll be happy to come back to the government debt issue as well, which is related to new work that I'm doing. But the last point related to Evie's presentation that I want to make, and, and this is a, sort of a, a, um, a statistical uh, point, um, when we talk about empirical relevance of the indebted demand framework, one thing to keep in mind is that the main purpose of indebted demand model, if you will, is to think about long run steady state relationships. And so uh, while you can certainly, you and we do that in the paper, you can use that framework to look at transition dynamics, 
the local projection framework is more on the line of thinking about transition dynamics. And it's a very important question, don't get me wrong. But the very essence of doing that kind of statistical analysis is that you detrend the data, you take the trends out, and you're just looking at the sort of the cyclicality around it. Um, the core of indirect demand force actually operates not at the transition dynamic frequency, if you will, but it's really across uh, those uh, transition dynamics. That is to say, it's really important to look across in the long run, across steady states. And it's almost as if the, the simpler analysis actually is more powerful for thinking about the long run steady state. And so I think that's why I focused on just presenting you the broader trend and so on. And I, of course, agree that uh, that might be less powerful in a statistical sense, but that is the way you want to look at the data to think about those long run steady state implications of the kind of forces that I was talking about. While at the same time, of course, you can also look at transition dynamics, but I did want to make that uh, uh, separation in terms of analysis of just the transition dynamics versus the long run steady state. Uh, Claudio, I'll stop here. I'm more than happy to come back to the government debt uh, fiscal spending question. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Hervé Lebihan. And by the way, if you want to ask questions, uh, please use the digital hand as opposed to your physical hand, or else write them down in the chat function. Hervé? Thank you. Thank you very much for the great uh, talks. I have a question maybe more for Evie, but I'm happy to hear both speakers. Uh, in the public debate, so inequality seems often attributed or associated with non-conventional monetary policies, and it seems the case in your in your paper with the shock that is interpreted uh, as forward guidance, uh, as I understand. Is it a, a general features of uh, non-conventional monetary policy, and can, can you elaborate a bit about the difference of uh, conventional versus non-conventional with respect to, to inequality? So, thank you. Let's take uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, Jorge Carrera from the uh, Central Bank of Argentina. I congrats the BIS to promote this kind of discussion. As always, you are innovating in Central Bank research. Uh, first, I fully agree uh, with the author to incorporate inequality as a structural variable in macro model. I think that is a very important point. But I want to remark something from the, an economic policy point of view. You say that the connection, uh, or you remark the connection between monetary policy and fiscal policy. But also you say that monetary policy is ill-equipped. Uh, in fact, there is something like a, a debt dominance in terms of carny uh, when you take the, that uh, interest rate should remain low for debt sustainability. And so you remark the, in, the importance of progressive taxation on income, and especially wealth tax. Uh, and this could be a, a good solution. But perhaps you need to, to incorporate a third dimension, I think, that is globalization. Because we are thinking all these uh, proposals, policy proposals, in a context of, of very open uh, capital account economies. And so this makes it very difficult to, to implement progressive tax policy in a context where you have a lot of tax competition among countries. So I think that maybe it's necessary to incorporate uh, the global coordination of tax policy. And perhaps the recent proposal of the G7, uh, and maybe in the next meeting, the, the proposal of the G20 regarding a floor for some type of tax now is uh, on companies, but maybe uh, thinking further in, in some type of uh, tax uh, wealth or, or the to global towing tax uh, could be a, a good proposal. I, I want to know what do you think about. Thank you very much. An excellent job. Um, let's take one more, then you can answer, uh, Atif. But there are more questions. So, um, Governor Sitaput. Yeah, question for Atif. Thank you very much for the paper. Very thought-provoking. Um, what happened in 1980 to drive that whole process, to get that whole process started? Uh, the, you know, the increasing extreme inequality, the rising share of debt, and, and the falling rates. What was the kind of the prime mover in that process? Thank you. Okay, maybe Atif, you can start answering. Again, there are more questions uh, in the queue. 
Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very short. Um, the question on the globalization and debt dominance, I basically agree with everything that was uh, uh, said. Uh, the open economy context is a very important context to keep in mind, and increasingly so, as was, was, was mentioned. Um, I did not have time to get into this sort of the importance of, uh, sort of the global savings club, if you will. Um, it kind of has very similar dynamics, right? So the basic point is that if for whatever reason, let's say China is saving a lot beyond sort of what they are investing and they are fund they are channeling those additional savings back into the rest of the economy, it looks like just a rise in inequality, right? That is basically isomorphic conceptually to what everything that I just talked about. And as a result, it has exactly the same set of issues and problems that I talked about. So that's that's that is sort of a, a, an, another important insight that I should have perhaps highlighted more. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And so you need to think about sort of uh, the implication of global savings plan from this particular perspective as well. And we need to do things about it uh, to to kind of dampen those kind of saving cuts. Uh, and that requires, as the, 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 the questioner again rightfully said, all of this stuff requires global coordination, including on the tax side. Um, so I think, you know, that's why I, that's partly why I ended up by saying, look, we can all in this together. And we can, and that's true within countries, but it's also true across countries. And that's the nature of humanity, that we can't just live in silos all the time. We do need to coordinate. You know, um, when you're building schools or and, and, and colleges, and it's also true when you're um, thinking about it, 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 the economy at a global level. So, yes, there are very important dimensions on which we do need to globally come together. I think BIS is an excellent forum for trying to do some of that uh, conversation. And that's why I'm a big fan of all of these multilateral institutions, because we need a lot more coordination, a lot more serious coordination where we understand what is in our common good and we focus on that and certainly coordinating on tax policy uh, is 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 one of uh, one of those um the other uh, question 1980 what happened um strictly speaking i would say look it's outside the scope of kind of the framework that i presented what is important is that it happened right in the sense that we we take it as given that there was this big shift in inequality it's a trillion dollar question, really, a multi-trillion dollar question, really, in terms of what really caused it. And there is a long literature by very sort of accomplished scholars uh, who really know this thing much better than I do, for example. What's the punchline of all of that work? Well, I, I think the best way to say that is it's a combination of forces. Uh, people have highlighted that the fall in top marginal tax rate has given a greater incentive for people to kind of at the very top to push inequality further. I think there is some truth to that. But then there are other forces. Globalization, uh, you know, winner take all kind of uh, environment would naturally lead to uh, more inequality, as well as changes in techno technology, as is uh, uh, well accepted um, um, uh, in, this, in this area. So I think all of those factors have contributed. But whatever those factors, you know, you can't change technology, for example. Um, and uh, so we need to respond to the challenges created because of those uh, changes in in, uh, in, 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 in in the structure of uh, the economy. Uh, but as I said, we do need to also think of ways where we can reverse some of those trends. Not all of them, but some of them are reversible. And so I think we do need to think about those for all the reasons that I talked about. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Benoit Monjon? Claudio, uh, thanks uh, Atif and, and Evie for very nice uh, presentations. Um, in terms of the of the of the portfolio composition of, of, of different uh, players, um, and that may have influenced the, the level of, of, of interest rate, you point to the super rich. One thing which the super rich do is uh, is to own uh, more stocks. Uh, than, uh, than the average portfolio in the economy. While uh, you also mentioned in your previous response uh, that some EMEs and essentially China uh, has increased uh, its holding of, uh, of savings. And there we know that the composition of this portfolio is, is tilted more towards uh, bonds uh, uh, and industry stocks. And you know one of the stylized facts of the of the last uh, 
30 years is that the, the risk premium between um, um, bonds and, and stocks has increased a lot. So, you know, taking this on board, it, it seems like, um, yes, there is a, a demand for uh, some agents to be kind enough to issue debt, uh, but in terms of whether it comes from, uh, um, you know, this change in inequality or uh, rather uh, a recomposition of, uh, of savings uh, on the planet, uh, it, it, you know, the, to, to the extent that uh, this other observable, the risk premium between uh, stocks and bonds uh, is, is relevant, it sounds like uh, it's more likely uh, to be uh, the recomposition of savings uh, on the planet than um, uh, the role of the super rich who, who should have pushed down the risk premium on, on risky assets because they hold more of it. Um, Atif, uh, let me uh, complement uh, uh, what we just heard with a couple of short questions. Um, the first one has to do with the empirical regularities that you have uh, mentioned. Um, you do see that before 1980, um, you have this relationship between um, inequality and debt is not quite there. They actually move in the, in the opposite direction. Um, related to that with colleagues, we have found that is in, it is indeed the case that since the early 1980s, there is a relationship between uh, rising inequality and falling real interest rates, uh, which you document here. But if you go further back in time, in, in other periods, in, and you can go back in time until the, all the way back to the 1870s, you don't quite see that relationship. Um, and so the question is, if you can speculate about the reasons for, for that, for the breaks that uh, have occurred. And the other question is related to uh, the monet monetary policy more specifically now, your model is a real model. You don't have nominal interest rates. It's just a real rate. And of course, there is no lower bound in the, in the real rate. Um, so some of the arguments that you made are relevant if you have a full-blown model in which you actually describe what the inflation process is like and, and, and so on. And I would like to invite you to speculate in such a model um, what would your model imply, if you, if you were to extend it, for the systematic monetary policy? Uh, what do you think would be an optimal uh, systematic monetary policy, taking into account that there has been a bit of a break in the relationship between inflation, uh, the output gap? And at the same time, we have seen big, a bigger role for financial factors, uh, credit expansion and credit contractions in uh, macroeconomic activity. Thanks, uh, Claudio. Um, excellent questions, and, and, and in fact, uh, these questions are these kind of questions have inspired us to do follow-up work, and we do use this excuse to discuss uh, some of that work. So, the first question on portfolio composition is exactly right. First of all, uh, empirically, yes, uh, the very rich portfolios are tilted towards the stocks. However. Um, the implication is not as strong as it might appear at first. Let me explain that. I mean, we do this, I, I hope, carefully, as, as well as we could, uh, in the savings glut of the rich paper. So I would really, really invite those of you who are interested in those kind of issues to read that paper, because it's all discussed uh, in, in detail there. Um, what we do is the following. We look at the U.S., and we look at the very rich portfolio, the portfolios of the very rich and the rest, uh, and we to take exactly take that portfolio uh, differences into account, as was just mentioned. Now, when you do that, it turns out, let me give you the punchline, it turns out that the saving glut of the rich that I was highlighting in the indebted demand framework, it remains extremely important quantitatively. In fact, we show it is the same order of magnitude as the saving glut coming from China, which is referred to as the global saving glut for the U.S., uh, so it remains there, and it remains to be as important as the global savings. Like, let me give you a quick intuition for why that is the case. Uh, the reason is that even if Bill Gates is not buying treasuries directly, it turns out Bill Gates is holding a ton of treasuries. How? Well, because he's holding a ton of Microsoft shares. 
And if you look inside Microsoft's share balance sheet, what you will realize is that the treasury of Microsoft is in turn holding a lot of cash in the form of US government treasuries. And so that is very important to take into account. You know, we must do the full analysis by unwinding all of the indirect holdings that Bill Gates has through his holding of Microsoft stock, which is then implicitly holding mortgage-backed securities and government debt securities, for example. So that's the exercise that we do, as I said, as carefully as, as, as one can. And when you do that, what we realize is that actually the very rich do own a ton of fixed income assets. In fact, they hold most of fixed income assets, both on the private and the public side. So that's an important uh, fact. Again, it's not kind of obvious, so I think it's, it's useful to highlight that, uh, and it's in, the, in that paper. Claudio, your questions on pre-980 uh, and long-run trends, and absolutely the right questions. Um, we have follow-up work. It's ongoing. It's not public yet. I mean, I don't have a paper, but I can talk about we, we, That's exactly what we are doing. Um, as, as I mentioned, first of all, to Evie, um, look, it's, it's a long-run steady-state question, right? So that's the lens one must have as opposed to looking at shorter-run dynamics where this steady-state analysis does not apply, strictly speaking. Um, so we are looking at like the longest time period, like a century and a half. Uh, this is the zuckman piketty work as well, quite related to that. And one thing that comes out of that analysis is, let me again give you the punchline. There is actually a very strong relationship between the interest rate and inequality in that long run lens. However, real interest rate, let me push back a little bit on as, as an empiricist on that, and which is it's extremely difficult to measure real interest rate before 1980. Because what you really need is the expected inflation and all of you know, you know all of the problems. Before 980, there's actually no really measure that at least I find very believable uh, to rely on. So what is a better measure of real interest rate? It turns out real interest rate is conceptually isomorphic to wealth to income ratio in the aggregate for kind of very intuitive reasons. Uh, as interest rate falls, wealth to income ratio rises because that's the valuation effect of falling interest rates. So that's what we do. We focus on that measure, which is much better measure in the longer span of history compared to the real interest rate measurement issues. Um, and when you use that measure, this relationship between inequality and uh, the valuation margin, which is the same as the interest rate question, uh, becomes a lot more apparent. Um, and this, by the way, is, to some extent, is also related to the to the to the to the um, um, uh, equity premium uh, question that was raised earlier. Uh, so again, that hopefully is coming out coming out uh, soon. So um, I, I I hope to get more feedback on that from all of you. Um, uh, Claudio, I did not fully understand your um, question where you were inviting me to speculate on, on what you exactly meant by systemic monetary policy. Oh, um, systematic, systematic monetary policy. What, what policy, you rules, policy rules, oh, policy rules. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So that's, um, that, I, I think that's a, that, that's, that's a fascinating uh, question. Um, if you, for, for example, if you can raise inflation targeting, um, that might help for all the reasons that have been mentioned. The only thing I would say in response to that is that, you know, right now we are just focused on this one dimension, but I am very cognizant of the fact, for example, that there are other dimensions uh, that you may start to worry about if, for example, you raise inflation expectations too much and you don't want to go into those uh, problems either. Uh, the other point I'll try to emphasize is that, and this would be kind of my real answer to that, which is, Yes, we can think about those lines, and I think uh, intellectually they are very useful and we should do that. However, I just feel that it is not the right place to try to solve these long-run structural problems through monetary policy. Um, again, for I, I think at this point, intuitive reasons, given the framework that I just described. Um, and it has, it, 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 you know, it, uh, uh, you, for example, let's say we were able to maintain low rates for very long and that gets rid of the, out, the negative output gap. Is that necessarily a good thing? I would argue no. You don't want to live in a very low rate environment for a very long period of time because one of the consequences of that is that valuations and wealth, asset values rise and they continue to rise. That's a dangerous thing 
because it perpetuates and intensifies wealth inequality. And so I, I think we need to take, and those are like, you know, that's all of that is outside of the model that I just talked about. But I think it's dimensions like that, since you asked me to speculate, and so I'm really speculating here. But my personal feeling is that it's because of those other forces which we are currently not thinking about, that I would start worrying about those forces a lot more if we really said, you know what, let's just re-engineer the whole monetary policy framework just to attack this particular problem that we have. I would argue monetary policy was never meant to be used to attack these kind of problems. So I would just shy away from that and focus on it through other means that I, some of those I tried to highlight at the very end of my, uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atif. I, I think we've just gone a little bit over, so we have come, we've got to the end of this conference, unfortunately. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the authors, even those who are not here, all the discussions, all the participants for the very active uh, discussions that we have had, the Q&A sessions, and also, of course, all those who are behind the scenes and have been uh, grappling with the technical aspects that uh, are even more important these days than for a normal uh, conference. And I very much hope to see you, f you physically and to be able to organize a conference next year where everyone is going to be here as opposed to just uh, seeing them through, uh, through a video. Uh, let me also add that this is not the end of um, food for thought and the intellectual events uh, of this, for this year, although again, we will have to hold them virtually. And that on um, Monday at 1.30 uh, Basel time, Central Eastern European time, uh, Mark Carney, whom you mentioned at TIFF, is going to give the Andrew Crockett lecture. And the title goes something like this. Uh, it's, I think the new, newest title is a little bit different, but centrifugal banking, multipolar money, decentralized finance, and the role of central banks. So that's uh, quite a lot. I'm pretty sure that it will be very, very interesting uh, presentation. So again, thank you all, and uh, hope to see you next year. Bye-bye.